Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting human evolution research and sharing discoveries. Today's episode looks takes a look at the factors that influence disease in primates. But before we dig deeper into this topic, we'd like to thank the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith, whose generous support made this episode possible. Let's bring on our guest, Leakey Foundation Baldwin Fellowship Scholar, Mercy Akinyi. Mercy, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, greetings from Nairobi, Kenya. It's uh, 10 p.m. So I, yeah. I, we, we, it's, it's, it's more like, um, like almost to the point where it's midnight snack science. <laughs> I think. <Yeah. laughs> uh, as, as you mentioned, you are joining us from, uh, Mercy is joining us from Nairobi, where she is a research scientist and veterinary doctor at the Institute of Primate Research in Kenya, where her research takes her to look at primate populations in the wild and places like Amboseli National Park and multiple places uh, across Kenya where primate habitats overlap with humans. Her research looks at the sources of variants in disease risk in um, wild animal populations and zoonosis risk factors. Uh, before we hear more from Mercy, though, if you are watching us live, please post comments and questions for Mercy in the chat, and she will be answering those questions live during the episode. The earlier you get those questions in, the more likely we will be featuring your question. Um, but my, my first question for you is, why are we interested in the diseases of wild primates, and what does that have to do with human evolution? That's a good question. Um, so a lot of times primates are reservoirs for zoonotic diseases. So zoonoses are um, patho uh, zoonotic pathogens, are pathogens that are transmitted between humans and animals. And so they cause disease in humans and animals. And so it's important to study diseases in primates so that you can be able to know what pathogens are circulating. But also something that is important is to be able to um, just study the diseases in primates due to conservation purposes. So by this, um, if you have endangered species of primates, we know that some of these diseases can um, change the populations, like lead to population decline, especially for the critically endangered species. So it is good to also know what's going on to, um, in the wild so as to come up with strategies um, to prevent such issues. At the same time, Primates are actually similar to humans in terms of their behavior and um, their physiology, and also in terms of um, uh, just other many things. And so whatever we learn in primates, uh, what, what that will do is give us some kind of insight to the origin of human pathogens and also just the basic disease transmission that is going on. Um, and just overall, whether we talk about animals or humans, diseases do shape the population genetics and populations have to adapt uh, so as to survive. So whether they're adapting to diseases or whatever is going on, that then impacts um, the general population. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, yeah. we're all very familiar with having to adapt because of diseases. Um, yeah. But um, so how do you study diseases in the wild and what are the most common diseases you encounter? Yeah, so when we study uh, primates, there are multiple approaches that we use. And so you can screen for like active infections or you can screen for past infections. So like active infections are ongoing infections. So when you look at um, ongoing infections, maybe you can take a blood sample and then screen it and know that there's a particular parasite uh, that the animal has, or if you take a stool sample and look at it, um, you can know what um, the animals are harboring. However, for past infections, what you look at are antibodies that have been raised uh, to a towards a particular disease. So that means that that animal must have had that disease, disease at some point. So did it have it yesterday? Did it have it two years ago? Did it have it one year ago? Uh, so that then is what we know as past uh, infection. And we have sampled multiple uh, non-human primate species. Baboons, varvets, and sykes are the most common ones that we have um, that we have encountered. And in terms of the diseases that we have seen, um, 
there are hemoparasites, uh, helminths, and even zoonotic uh, parasites. Like these are tick species that we got from several uh, baboons a while back, and I'll be talking more. And these are gastrointestinal parasites. A lot of them are soil transmitted helminths that also are ubiquitous in nature. Your yeah. work includes going in areas where humans and non-human primates are in very close proximity. What is the importance of engaging with the local communities in these areas? Yeah, it. Um, I mean, there are so many places where humans and wildlife interface. And so at that interface, there's so much going on. Some of the things that go on are anthropogenic activities. So these are just generally activities that humans do that kind of destroy the environment. So like, yeah. for example, deforestation or just logging, um, things like bushmeat hunting. So some of these contribute to emergence of uh, disease. Some of this lead to a uh, more transmission of the disease. And so it is important that the community is aware of what's going on um, and uh, probably for them to be able to identify the diseases that are there and what measures they can take in case of an outbreak. And so this is always um, a key issue, like going out to the community and educating them about some of these things is important. One of the other things that happens is the community uh, with their livestock and also uh, with other wildlife, they share resources, for example, water. And so if you're looking at um, the sharing of such resources, then like water can be contaminated by different uh, parasites and that can end up going to the community. The other thing is um, conservation. The community need to be told that wildlife are not uh, enemies. Like they need to stop bush bushmeat hunting, like what we can see in the picture and the traps. And so they need to be told that you need to conserve these animals because they are a heritage. But also at the end of the day, uh, in the control of zoonosis, we are told we need to embrace like a one health approach. And this has to do with a, a policy formulation and implementation. And so if you don't engage the community right from the beginning, then I feel like it's a losing battle. You need to engage them and they need to understand why uh, zoonosis control is important. Yeah. It's so neat that you get to do that as part of your work because I feel like, you know, um, having worked in the lab, before it can be quite um quite you know d dry <laughs> um, but to actually get to go out and you know interact with the community it really brings it to life yeah it it definitely it definitely brings it to life and they're also excited to hear about what we do because they just see us with the cars and all the yeah. samples we're collecting and they're like what are you doing so when you go back and tell them this is what we took from your community this is what we looked at and now we're giving it back to you and even engaging them in terms of our questionnaire surveys and looking at the perceptions that they have it's really cool actually you get a lot of data and you learn so much uh from the communities yeah I mean, outreach is clearly uh, something that you are quite passionate about. Another aspect of outreach that you focus on is mentorship. Uh, tell us more about that. Yes, I mean, um, I I believe that uh, for us to have good career progression, we have to be mentored. I have been mentored by very many people, uh, especially by my graduate advisor, uh, Professor Susan Alberts, who has been key to even... Um, my ability to go ahead and do a master's research project and even proceed to a PhD a project. But I've also had many other people who are mentors from the Amboseli project uh, from Duke, from the Institute of Primate Research where I work, and also uh, from the Cambry Wellcome Trust where I did my postdoc. So the pictures that you see are pictures of different trainings that we do with some of our staff but also with our um, undergraduate interns and graduate interns and uh, master's students. And so I enjoy being able to um, show them some of the things that I've learned in the lab, whether it's microscopy of different parasites or PCR, or like now we are trying to learn how to use a, a new uh, kind of small sequencer that we have in the lab. So it's been exciting to go through uh, these sessions with them, but I'm also a member of different women professional groups. So I'm a member of the Kenya, Veterinary, Kenya Women Veterinary Association and the Organization of Women 
for science in developing uh, countries, the Kenyan chapter. And what these programs do is to mentor the younger vets who are coming up, but also to mentor high schoolers and tell them, look, science is fascinating and there's much that you can get from them and encourage them to take up um, the scientific subjects pretty much, yeah. So when when did you know that you wanted to pursue a career in science? Oh, I don't think I knew I wanted to pursue uh, a career in science. I did know that I loved seeing nurses and doctors and just admiring uh, what they were doing. And so I eventually did biology and chemistry amongst other subjects in, in, um, in high school and did well and joined the university to do uh, a veterinary degree. So after being um, after finishing my veterinary degree, then I joined up, uh, the Primary Research Institute in, in Nairobi. And uh, when I was there, um, I did offer a lot of clinical veterinary work, but that means I was also involved in research. And so somehow I just got attracted and kind of uh, started making my path towards uh, research. And so um, I ended up doing my master's, which is what I'll be talking about, which is uh, a study that was on tick load and grooming, but I also ended up doing a PhD um, at Duke. So I have done primate research for over 15 years now, and I've really enjoyed it. And I believe that my research somehow contributes to improving human health, which still at the end of the day translates to um, medicine in one way or another, yeah. So you received uh, the Leakey Foundation's Baldwin uh, Fellowship, uh, how did that impact your career? When uh, when I received the Baldwin Fellowship, I remember I was in the lab and I was like, I don't want to read the email. <laughs> it's like, maybe I need to read it tomorrow. And I actually did read it. Like I waited until the next day and I and I opened the email and I was like, oh my goodness, I should have read this the day before. <laughs> but it was like my uh, very first scientific grant in, in graduate school. And um it actually funded, I think, almost all my thesis uh, chapters. So that was really uh, fascinating. I was able to go to the field, uh, collect samples. Um, that's one of the pictures of us uh, with, with uh, one of my friends, Amanda, in the field. And it, there was so much excitement being in the field. Of course, a few challenges here and there, uh, like having our car get stuck. But overall, I enjoyed the field uh, experience. But apart from just having data for my for my research. The other thing that these funds contributed to were my ability to attend scientific conferences and share uh, the work that we had, and also just being able to have equipment uh, support um, at, at, at the Institute of Primate Research. So the Baldwin gave me quite a bit of good things and I'm grateful uh, to, the, to the fellowship, yeah, the fellowship uh, organizing committee, yeah. Yeah, that's us, I think, after one of the darting sessions. And we normally have like a victory egg. So that's the victory egg <laughs> that we'd have, yeah. And I actually, I just I just noticed that um, uh, a familiar face in that last picture. Uh, yes. That is, uh, yeah, that yeah. is uh, Jenny Tang, who is um, actually a past lunch break science speaker. So um, definitely check out uh, her episode, uh, episode four. Uh, we'll share a link to that in the chat. Um, and uh, it, it was, it's funny because as you, uh, you sent the photos, I was looking at them, I'm like, oh, like I've seen these photos. Like we've already kind of, we've already seen you on lunch break in Jenny's presentation. So uh, um, it was um, it was really great to, to get to, you know, know the story behind the photos. Um, yeah. So what, what were some of your early career uh, or early research projects in your career? Uh, I think the earliest research project was actually my master's degree work, and that had to do with um, looking at the role of um, uh, ticks that, that that ticks have of that that grooming has. Sorry, uh, when it comes to reducing tick load, so I probably won't focus much on it here. But during the presentation, I can talk more about it. Yeah. Uh, those are uh, baboons in Amboseli. A lot of them are yellow baboons, and uh, there's some admixture with um, olive baboons. And this is blood smear preparation um, on one of the slides. So we do this right in the field. 
And this, this just shows you the tackle box, all that. This is used for fishing, but we love it because you can <laughs> organize all the tubes. And it's really cool with the different layers. Uh, I, I love that about, about the tackle boxes, yeah. <laughs> Or well, you know, whatever works. You gotta, you got. I mean, they don't. I don't think that they make specific. I, I don't. know, Maybe they do make specific carrying boxes. But uh, you know, if, if that works. Um. So, what was it like first being out in the field? Um. I didn't know what to expect when I went out to the field. Um. I knew it would be remote, and for sure, when I went there, it was remote. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's like in the middle of the park and. All that you can see occasionally are uh, are Maasai's, but it is beautiful on its own. This is the swamp um, at the park when there's water, it's really uh, beautiful. Um, and so when I went first to the field, I thought I'd be sleeping in a, um, in a sleeping bag and um, I got there and there were really nice tents with like a bed. So that was really cool. You can see one right at the back, but also the field team, uh, was really amazing it's it's a wonderful group of kenyans who are there year round and being in the field made me appreciate what they do at the time they were studying over 300 animals and they actually know each of these animals by name like they know each of them like they've given names to them and uh for the whole time that i was there i could just never figure out which animal was which one uh and so i think it's really good to have such um such a team and plus the baboons that are studied there because they've been studied over, I don't know, five decades now. They're really habituated um, to, the, to the field assistants. And I think getting habituated groups of primates is really difficult. So um, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, yeah. Uh, what is the importance of long-term primate research sites? Yeah, as as um, as I had mentioned, um, a lot of times there are multiple approaches to look at, like if it's disease, to look at disease. And one of the things that you can do is you can have a cross-sectional study or you can have a longitudinal study. The cross-sectional study, really, it's like a one-time trap and release project where you just get the animals, you don't even know the animals, just get some blood or stool samples and then release them back. But for the longitudinal sites, it means you can sample the same population multiple times and so um, and over the years and have such fine-grained data like data on age, data on um, the behavior that they have, data on survival, data on disease burden across different times. So um, if you ask me, I'd, I'd love for us to have multiple um, longitudinal primate feed sites. Though I know that this is probably challenging because then there's also a financial uh, cost uh, thing to think about there, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, and um, the Leaky Foundation has actually established a, uh, a fund, the Primate Research Fund, that focuses on long-term field research sites that are increasingly facing gaps in funding and emergencies uh, if you are watching this and your long-term primate research site is experiencing these kind of circumstances, please check out um, the link we'll share in the chat about the Primate Research Fund. And if you're passionate about primates and are looking for something to contribute to for World Wildlife Day today, um, you can make a, a substantial difference for vulnerable primates, long-term field research sites, and their local staff members. Uh, you can consider supporting the Primate Research Fund. We've shared a link to donate in the chat. And actually, all donations um, that are made today will be quadruple matched by our donors. So that we're um, very excited to share this opportunity. Now, though, uh, I am very excited to hear more about your research, Mercy. Let us turn the virtual floor over to you. But um, if you are enjoying this episode of Lunch Break Science, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook to Twitter or LinkedIn. We have, we're now live streaming to LinkedIn as well. Um, and if you hit the little um, uh, bell to set reminders, you will be sure to see all of our upcoming episodes. So now let us turn the floor over to you, Mercy, and learn more about your research. Great. Sorry about that. So, 
So today I'll be talking about behavior and parasitism in a wild baboon population. Uh, and this is work that was done uh, across the years, right, from my master's through to my uh, PhD. So we know that parasites have wide detrimental uh, effects on host health and survival, and that behavior actually influences parasite burden and vice versa. So today I'll just talk about two different studies um, that actually show the connection between behavior and parasite burden. And the behavior here in question is grooming behavior, which is um, done by so many primates and has social and health uh, benefits. Uh, Mercy, uh, Mercy. I, for some odd reason, we are not seeing your slides. Um, let us, uh, do you wanna try uh, resharing them? Oh, okay. okay. Um, Sorry about this. Every so often, something like this happens. Um, yeah. So should we stop share? Because currently yeah. I can see them. So Megan says she can see the slides. So uh, can the audience see the slides at all? Maybe that would be helpful. Yeah. But uh, that uh, that would be very helpful. Audience, can you can you see the slides? Is there anything? <laughs> our our easiest question quiz. Can you see the slides to our left? No. Okay. We have one no. Um, so um, let us, what we're going to do is, uh, Mercy, why don't you go ahead and um, when you when you hit the share setting um, and um, the slides pop up, delete those slides. And, um, and then uh, add them back in. Uh, we are going to put on a slideshow of baboon photos in the meantime um, with some music for your enjoyment. And um, we will get those slides back very, very shortly. Everything was working <laughs> right before. <laughs> We are working on the slides and we will be back very, very shortly. So uh, just be a little more patient and we'll see some more uh, uh, slides. Okay, hold on, one more.
Okay, I think we have the slides, um, and I think we let let's see here. Okay, here we go. Slides, and thank you so much. I'm so sorry about that. Every so often, that was totally not your fault. That was totally some weird techno uh, uh, issue going on. Um, so thank you so much for your patience, uh, Mercy, okay. and thank you for your patience, viewers. Um, we will now get into your fascinating talk. Okay, great. So as I was saying, uh, I'm going to be talking about behavior and parasitism in a wild baboon population. And um, I talked about parasites having uh, detrimental effects on both host health and survival, and that host behavior influences parasite burdens and vice versa. So today I'll be talking about two studies that show how behavior has influenced parasite burden. And the behavior here in question is grooming behavior, which is a social activity for many uh, non-human primates and has both health and social uh, benefits. So the study area is the Amboseli region in Kenya that we have talked about and you've seen beautiful pictures. And the um, animals that we look at are yellow baboons, though they experience some admixture with olive baboons. And these are individuals of a long-term um, individual-based monitoring for very many decades. And so there are fine-grained data on different life history events, such as birth and maturations, migrations, death, social interactions, and social and biological samples, such as blood and stool, um, and stool samples. So for the first study that was looking at grooming received and tick load, we darted 20, uh, 65 um, baboons and got blood from them and made a blood smear preparation, did hematocrit analysis, and then did PCR screening uh, for different uh, hemoparasites. We also did collect ticks and later on identified them and counted them. So ticks from each animal were actually preserved in ethanol. And as I said, uh, the Amboseli uh, baboons, there's such a good um, data set. So the, demo, the, the demographic, demographic data, such as age, sex, uh, dominance rank, meaning whether the animal is high ranking or low ranking, and the counts of grooming received six months prior to the dating period. All of these are data that we had in our data set. Um, and so one of the interesting things from this study was seeing uh, the animals, some animals that had tick infestation. So you can say like for this animal, Logan, it had ticks um, on the chest and the second animal on the neck and the third one on the armpit, all of which are considered areas where individuals cannot, um, cannot self-groom. They have to be groomed by uh, someone else. Um, and we also saw... Sorry. We also saw different species of ticks. So on the right side, there are a bunch of ticks that are from the Ripicephalus simus fam family. And on the left side, this beautiful color, colorful ticks are from the Ripicephalus pulchellus family. And then the last one are uh, Hyaloma. And all of these are sets of um, hard ticks. And um, these ticks are known to transmit some zoonotic diseases such as uh, Babesia. So one of the diseases we were screening for was Babesia, but we found it in very low, um, the prevalence was very low. So we didn't pursue uh, much of that. So just generally looking at um, tick load and hematocrit, uh, we saw that higher grooming counts predicted lower ticks. So here you can see there's a tick load and these are the counts of uh, grooming received by an individual. And we can see the inverse relationship. At the same time, we also saw that higher tick loads uh, predicted lower hematocrit. And the hematocrit is also known as the packed cell volume, which is just one of the indices of, um, of anemia. And ticks are known to um, cause some kind of uh, anemia. So in conclusion for this particular study, we saw that grooming reduces tick load and improves hematocrit. Uh, the second study looked at behavior and helminth burden in female baboons. And so we had 745 uh, fecal samples collected over five years from 122 female baboons. Again, emphasizing how amazing longitudinal um, research uh, looks like because this is such uh, wonderful uh, data. 
And so the other demographic data we had um, were on each of the individuals, but also uh, the host environment, such as rainfall, um, the temperature, and also different behaviors, so like um, agonistic behavior or just dyadic interactions. And then from the stool samples, we were able to get uh, hormone levels, but also generally we're also able to look at uh, different reproductive indices, which I'll also talk about. So using these sets of data, we investigated two main things, uh, the drivers of helminth infection and the costs of helminth infection. So this picture just, um, this figure goes to just explain and give a brief overview that there are many processes that influence helminth burden. And these processes um, can be categorized as population processes, meaning the whole population is uh, getting exposed to them, such as um, uh, factors such as uh, temperature and rainfall. Then there are group level uh, processes, because again, we know that baboons live in, in groups, in social groups. Uh, but then there are also host level processes. So for each individual, whatever is going on also would influence helminth burdens. And each of these processes would either influence um, exposure to the parasite, or it would influence host susceptibility to the parasite. And so those are two main ways by which burden is actually um, affected. So this just shows, this picture just shows some of the species uh, of helminths that we see in uh, in the Amboseli baboons. And the most common one is Trichuris, Trichura, but we also have uh, strongyles, which are of multiple genuses. And um, there, there's also a Breviata and uh, a few other species, uh, some of which are, are, are zoonotic, meaning they can be transmitted between humans and, and animals. So again, that zoonotic angle comes up uh, from our previous discussion. So for the drivers of helminth uh, burden, I like this table mostly because it shows that there are different types of helminth, there are different helminth uh, taxa. And so, what I wanted us to focus on for this particular result is just the social connectedness. And this is an index that um, was showing the amount of grooming given or received. And from here we see for the males, especially for Trichuris Trichura, the highly connected the male was, uh, sorry, the highly connected uh, the, the, the females were, then there was reduced uh, levels of helminth burden. And that happened both for parasite richness and for trichuris trichura. And parasite richness is just an index uh, of the number of parasites that an individual is, uh, is uh, harboring. And so social connectedness decreases helminth burden, though there's an exception, at least for one parasite. Um, and that parasite is transmitted by um, vectors. So maybe that would explain uh, why the trend for that was different. Um, and then the next result was looking at reproductive, reproductive costs. Sorry about that. And uh, generally what IBI means is interbath interval. Remember it is good for an animal to quickly go back, uh, like from, from the time that it's gotten an infant, it's actually beneficial for the animal to then go back to cycling as soon as they can so that they can have more offspring. And so what we were looking at was the interbath interval and indices associated with interbath interval. And so uh, parasite richness, uh, trichuris, strongyles, all of these factors end up leading to prolonged interbath interval, which is a cost for, um, for the female. So for the stress hormones, again, we saw that this is the, the stress hormones right here where we see on the y-axis, the log fecal glucocorticoid concentration and um, on the x-axis, the trichuris counts, there's a, a positive correlation, meaning that the higher the egg counts, the higher the, the glucocorticoids, indicating some form of energetic stress going on due to the helminth, uh, helminth burdens. 
So in conclusion, all of this was just kind of a summary of what you would look at. And so multiple level processes influence helmet burden and social isolation from our data is associated with higher helminth uh, burden. And helminth burdens prolong interbirth intervals and helminth burden is associated with uh, fecal glucocorticoids. And um, for me to do this work, there are so many people who have contributed, uh, but a special thanks especially to the Amboseli Baboon Research Project and my home institute, this Institute of Primate Research uh, amongst other institutes for their support but equally again to the Leakey Foundation and Duke University for their support uh, to me during uh, grad school. And with that, uh, thank you. And we'll take questions. I'll take questions. Well, uh, we will be taking questions from the audience, as you mentioned. Uh, if you are watching and you have not submitted your question, get those questions into the chat right now. Um, I have a first question for you. What um, what do the baboons do with the ticks that oh. they <laughs> groom off of? <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them eat them. Like, they'll take them and they'll kind of bite them. Uh, some <laughs> of them throw them. So, I don't know. I think it it depends on 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 each individual baboon. <laughs> yeah. I'm picturing them having like a, a, a tick-throwing game. Um, <laughs> um, or a our, counting game. <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay. Um, our first question comes from Jim. Okay. Jim asks, have you noticed differences in immunity or susceptibility to disease between species of baboons? Um, I think from the data set that we have, um, I did not do like, um, uh, I, I did not, I, I did not factor that in when we were doing the analysis. Remember the Amboseli, uh, species of baboons, a lot of them have like an admixture. So it's very yeah. hard to find like a pure yellow or a pure olive. But there is work that I think has been done by um, by Jenny and, 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 and a few others. And they just look at hybridity scores and, and ways that hybridity affects different factors in, in baboons. So maybe there could be a difference. But from what I had in this study, I can't confidently answer that question. Yeah. Our next question comes from H. Yeah, H asks, uh, speaking of disease, uh, please share with us how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected your research and work activities. And do, have you seen COVID-19 in any of the baboons? Ah, yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, I, yes, definitely my postdoc actually stalled because I was doing a postdoc in 2020 when we first heard about the pandemic. And I had to take a break for, I think, a year or so. And so I went back to my institute and I ended up um, working at a COVID center. We established a COVID center and we did a lot of training and even helping with um, screening for COVID cases in our country. And so that was really good because I was able to apply some of the skills um, that I had. But I also got a, a grant that was looking at um, whether animals had SARS-CoV-2 and this particular animals are Sykes and Colobus monkeys. And so we looked at those and uh, we didn't see anything. But I was also looking at the ACE2 receptor diversity, which is one of the receptors responsible for COVID in primates, just to see um, how similar they are to humans. So that is work that I'm actually winding up right, right on right now. But definitely COVID put like a stall, I think like a year and a half. And I also got COVID not just once, but multiple times. <laughs> but yeah, so definitely um, COVID has been a setback. And one of the other things is the shipping of reagents. You know, oh, when we are here in Kenya, we get a lot of things from outside Kenya and it just, the shipping was just delayed for so many things. So we are still feeling the impact of, of COVID. Um, hope, hopefully things will change. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, our, our next question comes from Alice. Alice asks, do you have any data on infant mortality rates from disease? Hmm. No, I, 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 I haven't seen that. I think it's an interesting question that I probably uh, should pose to the, uh, to the Amboseli group. It might be something interesting uh, to look at, um, given that they have that kind of a good population that they can follow. Apple, yeah. 
Absolutely. It'd be a really interesting topic to delve deeper into on a on an upcoming episode um, when when we find who has some research there or when that research happens. Um, our next question comes from Cheryl. Uh, in addition to it being a World Wildlife Day today, it is also uh, a Women's History Month this month. So um, Ambicelli has such an amazing legacy of women leaders. Uh, Altman, Albert, so many others. How does it feel to be part of and continue that proud tradition? Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more with uh, with with, with uh, Cheryl. Um, I when I started my master's project, I was supervised by Jean and Susan. They were my master's thesis supervisors, but I also worked alongside uh, Jenny, and that was um, it's been I've known them for more than fifteen years, and they are phenomenal. Like I, I have enjoyed being mentored uh, by them, but also one of the other directors, Beth Archie, also was instrumental when I was doing my PhD and I've also interacted with them. And so I am really, I feel privileged and honored to have um, worked with them and still working with them as a collaborator. We still do many events together. And um, the kind of mentorship that they've given me makes me want to mentor other people. And so I hope that with the strong leadership that I can also have other women after me who are also um, amazing and equally good in research. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's so um, it it's so exciting to hear that. And um, kind of adding on to that, do you have any advice for those who are watching? who are interested in uh, studying science? Absolutely, I do. Um, I mean, studying science and even just basic science is instrumental to so many things. The medical um, innovations that we've had, such as even the invention of the COVID vaccine amongst so many other things, all of these are built on basic science. And so I'd encourage those who enjoy science to keep up with it because there's still so much that is not known and it would be good if we knew it and know how to use that information to improve our own human health and even animal animal health, yeah. So I have a last question and um, it is, do you have a, uh, a dream project that you would, you would love if, if funding <laughs> were no, if were unlimited and you, you could have the time to, well, what would you yeah. wanna do? I would want to set up uh, uh, a field site that um, would have like a one health approach, meaning I would uh, study, like have a longitudinal approach to studying humans, their livestock, primates, and other wildlife, all in the same ecosystem, plus the environmental changes, and just have a holistic one health approach, like over years, whether it's 20 years or 30 years, I think that would be fantastic. Uh, if that would ever happen. Yeah. Well, I, I hope that that does happen. And I hope that you come back and tell us all about it. Okay. Great. So, thank you so much uh, for joining us, Mercy. And and thank you uh, for uh, for bearing with us through that technical difficulty. It was, um, you you just started back up immediately. So it's, it's always wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I've enjoyed being in the show. Yeah. So next time on Lunch Break Science, we will be meeting Kelly Stewart and learn about gorillas, their conservation, and Dr. Stewart's career. It'll be a really great, another really great episode. So thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next time, stay hungry for knowledge. Bye. Lunch Break Science is brought to you by the Leakey Foundation and is made possible by the generous support of the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith. Celebrate World Wildlife Day by helping us support and protect vulnerable primates and long-term research sites. Right now, all donations to the Primate Research Fund will be quadruple matched by generous sponsors, meaning your impact will be quadrupled. Subscribe to the Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or sign up for our newsletter to be the first to hear about exciting episodes and upcoming programs.
miss an episode of Lunch Break Science? Catch up on past episodes and browse our library of Leaky Foundation lectures on our YouTube channel. Still hungry for science and can't wait till our next episode? Check out Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Visit us at leakyfoundation.org to learn more about the Leaky Foundation, today's guest scientists, our education programs, research grants, scholarships, and other opportunities, human evolution news, how you can help support human evolution research, and programs like Lunch Break Science, and much, much more. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time. <laughs>